Chapter Fourteen of Jill the Reckless by P. G. Woodhouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Mr. Goble makes the big noise. One. Spring, whose coming the breeze had heralded to Wally as he smoked upon the roof, floated graciously upon New York two mornings later. The city awoke to a day of blue and gold, and to a sense of hard times over and good times to come. In his apartment on Park Avenue, Mr. Isaac Goble, sniffing the gentle air from the window of his breakfast-room, returned to his meal and his morning telegraph, with a resolve to walk to the theatre for rehearsal, a resolve which had also come to Jill and Nellie Bryant, eating stewed prunes in their boarding-house in the forties. On the summit of his skyscraper, Wally Mason, performing Swedish exercises to the delectation of various clerks and stenographers in the upper windows of neighboring buildings, felt young and vigorous and optimistic, and went into his shower-bath thinking of Jill. And it was of Jill, too, that young Pilkington thought, as he propped his long form up against the pillows and sipped his morning cup of tea. For the first time in several days a certain moodiness which had affected Otis Pilkington left him, and he dreamed happy daydreams. The gaiety of Otis was not, however, entirely or even primarily due to the improvement in the weather. It had its source in a conversation which had taken place between himself and Jill's Uncle Chris on the previous night. Exactly how it had come about Mr. Pilkington was not entirely clear but somehow before he was fully aware of what he was saying he had begun to pour into major selby's sympathetic ears the story of his romance encouraged by the other's kindly receptiveness he had told him all his love for jill his hopes that some day it might be returned the difficulties complicating the situation owing to the known prejudices of mrs wadsley p grimm concerning girls who formed the personnel of musical comedy ensembles to all these outpourings major selby had listened with keen attention and finally had made one of those luminous suggestions so simple yet so shrewd which emanate only from your man of the world it was jill's girlish ambition it seemed from major selby's statement to become a force in the motion picture world the movies were her objective what he broke off to ask did pilkington think of the idea pilkington thought the idea splendid miss mariner with her charm and looks would be wonderful in the movies there was said uncle chris a future for the girl in the movies mr pilkington agreed cordially a great future indeed observe proceeded uncle chris gathering speed and expanding his chest as he spread his legs before the fire how it would simplify the whole matter if jill were to become a motion picture artist and win fame and wealth in her profession you go to your excellent aunt and announce that you are engaged to be married to jill mariner there is a momentary pause not the jill mariner falters mrs pegram yes the famous miss mariner you reply well i ask you my boy can you see her making any objection such a thing would be absurd no i can see no flaw in the project whatsoever here uncle chris as he had pictured mrs pegram doing paused for a moment of course there would be the preliminaries the preliminaries uncle chris's voice became a melodious coo he beamed upon mr pilkington well think for yourself my boy these things cannot be done without money i do not propose to allow my niece to waste her time and her energy in the rank and file of the profession waiting years for a chance that might never come there is plenty of room at the top and that in the motion picture profession is the place to start if jill is to become a motion picture artist a special company must be formed to promote her she must be made a feature a star from the beginning whether said uncle chris smoothing the crease of his trousers you would wish to take shares in the company yourself oh as a matter proceeded uncle chris ignoring the interruption for you yourself to decide possibly you have other claims on your purse 
Possibly this musical play of yours has taken all the cash you are prepared to lock up. Possibly you may consider the venture too speculative. Possibly there are a hundred reasons why you may not wish to join us. But I know a dozen men, I can go down Wall Street tomorrow and pick out twenty men, who will be glad to advance the necessary capital. I can assure you that I personally shall not hesitate to risk if one can call it risking, any loose cash which I may have lying idle at my banker's. He rattled the loose cash which he had lying idle in his trouser pocket, fifteen cents in all, and stopped to flick a piece of fluff off his coat sleeve. Mr. Pilkington was thus enabled to insert a word. "'How much would you want?' he inquired. "'That,' said Uncle Chris meditatively, "'is a little hard to say.' i should have to look into the matter more closely in order to give you the exact figures but let us say for the sake of argument that you put up what shall we say a hundred thousand fifty thousand no we will be conservative perhaps you had better not begin with more than ten thousand you can always buy more shares later i don't suppose i shall begin with more than ten thousand myself i could manage ten thousand all right excellent we make progress we make progress very well then i go to my wall street friends and tell them about the scheme and say here is ten thousand dollars what is your contribution it puts the affair on a business-like basis you understand then we really get to work but use your own judgment my boy you know use your own judgment i would not think of persuading you to take such a step if you felt at all doubtful think it over sleep on it and whatever you decide to do on no account say a word about it to jill it would be cruel to raise her hopes until we are certain that we are in a position to enable her to realize them and of course not a word to mrs pegram of course very well then my boy said uncle chris affably i will leave you to turn the whole thing over in your mind act entirely as you think best how is your insomnia by the way did you try nervino capital there is nothing like it. It did wonders for me. Good night. Good night. Otis Pilkington had been turning the thing over in his mind with an interval for sleep ever since, and the more he thought of it, the better the scheme appeared to him. He winced a little at the thought of the ten thousand dollars, for he came of prudent stock and had been brought up in habits of parsimony, but after all, he reflected, the money would be merely a loan. Once the company found its feet, it would be returned to him a hundredfold and there was no doubt that this would put a completely different aspect on his wooing of jill as far as aunt olive was concerned why a cousin of his young brewster fillmore had married a movie star only two years ago and nobody had made the slightest objection brewster was to be seen with his bride frequently beneath mrs pegram's roof against the higher strata of bohemia mrs pegram had no prejudice at all quite the reverse in fact she liked the society of those whose names were often in the papers and much in the public mouth it seemed to otis pilkington in short that love had found a way he sipped his tea with relish and when the japanese valet brought in the toast all burned on one side chided him with a gentle sweetness which one may hope touched the latter's oriental heart and inspired him with a desire to serve his best of employers more efficiently at half-past ten otis pilkington removed his dressing-gown and began to put on his clothes to visit the theatre there was a rehearsal call for the whole company at eleven as he dressed his mood was as sunny as the day itself and the day by half-past ten was sunny as ever spring day had been in a country where spring comes early and does its best from the very start the blue sky beamed down on a happy city to and fro the citizenry bustled aglow with the perfection of the weather everywhere was gaiety and good cheer except on the stage of the gotham theatre where an early rehearsal preliminary to the main event had been called by johnson miller in order to iron some of the kinks out of the my heart and i number which with the assistance of the male chorus the leading lady was to render in act one on the stage of the gotham gloom reigned literally because the stage was wide and deep and was illumined only by a single electric light and figuratively because things were going even worse than usual with the my heart and i number and johnson miller always of an emotional and easily stirred temperament had been goaded by the incompetence of his male chorus to a state of frenzy 
At about the moment when Otis Pilkington shed his flowered dressing-gown and reached for his trousers, the heather mixture with the red twill, Johnson Miller was pacing the gangway between the orchestra pit and the first row of the orchestra chairs, waving one hand and clutching his white locks with the other, his voice raised the while in agonized protest. "'Gentlemen, you silly idiots!' complained Mr. Miller loudly. "'You've had three weeks to get these movements into your thick heads, and you haven't done a damn thing right. You're all over the place. You don't seem able to turn without tumbling over each other like a lot of keystone cops. What's the matter with you? You're not doing the movements I showed you. You're doing some you have invented yourselves, and they are rotten. I've no doubt you think you can arrange a number better than I can, but Mr. Goble engaged me to be the director, so kindly do exactly as I tell you. Don't try to use your own intelligence, because you haven't any. I'm not blaming you for it. It wasn't your fault that your nurses dropped you on your heads when you were babies, but it handicaps you when you try to think. Of the seven gentlemanly members of the male ensemble present, six looked wounded by his tirade. They had the air of good men wrongfully accused. They appeared to be silently calling on heaven to see justice done between Mr. Miller and themselves. The seventh, a long-legged young man in faultlessly fitting tweeds of English cut, seemed, on the other hand, not so much hurt as embarrassed. It was this youth who now stepped down to the darkened footlights and spoke in a remorseful and conscience-stricken manner. "'What say?' Mr. Miller, that martyr to deafness, did not hear the pathetic bleat. He had swung off at right angles, and was marching in an overwrought way up the central aisle leading to the back of the house, his india-rubber form moving in convulsive jerks. Only when he had turned and retraced his steps did he perceive the speaker and prepare to take his share in the conversation. "'What?' he shouted. "'Can't hear you!' "'I say, you know, it's my fault, really.' "'What?' "'I mean to say, you know.' "'What? Speak up! Can't hear you!' Mr. Salzburg, who had been seated at the piano, absently playing a melody from his unproduced musical comedy, awoke to the fact that the services of an interpreter were needed. He obligingly left the music-stool and crept crab-like along the ledge of the stage-box. He placed his arm about Mr. Miller's shoulders and his lips to Mr. Miller's left ear and drew a deep breath. "'He says it's his fault!' Mr. Miller nodded adhesion to this admirable sentiment. "'I know they're not worth their salt,' he replied. Mr. Salzburg patiently took in a fresh stock of breath. "'This young man says it's his fault that the movement went wrong.' "'Tell him I only signed on this morning, laddie,' urged the tweed-clad young man. "'He only joined the company this morning.' This puzzled Mr. Miller. "'How do you mean warning?' he asked. Mr. Salzburg, purple in the face, made a last effort. "'This young man is new,' he bellowed carefully, keeping to words of one syllable. "'He does not yet know the steps. He says this is his first day here, so he does not yet know the steps. When he has been here some more time, he will know the steps. But now he does not know the steps.' "'What he means,' explained the young man, and tweeds helpfully, "'is that I don't know the steps.' "'He does not know the steps,' roared Mr. Salzburg. "'I know he doesn't know the steps,' said Mr. Miller. "'Why doesn't he know the steps? He's had long enough to learn them.' "'He is new.' "'Hugh?' "'New.' "'Oh, new?' "'Yes, new.' "'Why the devil is he new?' cried Mr. Miller, awaking suddenly to the truth and filled with a sense of outrage. "'Why didn't he join with the rest of the company?' How can I put on chorus numbers if I am saddled every day with new people to teach? Who engaged him? Who engaged you? inquired Mr. Salzburg of the culprit. Mr. Pilkington. Mr. Pilkington! shouted Mr. Salzburg. When? When? Last night. Last night. Mr. Miller waved his hands in a gesture of divine despair, spun round, darted up the aisle, turned and bounded back. "'What can I do?' he wailed. "'My hands are tied. I am hampered. I am handicapped. We open in two weeks, and every day I find somebody new in the company to upset everything I have done. I shall go to Mr. Goble and ask to be released from my contract. I shall. Come along, come along, come along now,' he broke off suddenly. "'Why are we wasting time? The whole number once more, the whole number once more from the beginning.' The young man tottered back to his gentlemanly colleagues, running a finger in an agitated manner around the inside of his collar. 
He was not used to this sort of thing. In a large experience of amateur theatricals he had never encountered anything like it. In the breathing space afforded by the singing of the first verse and refrain by the lady who played the heroine of the Rose of America, he found time to make an inquiry of the artist on his right. "'I say, is he always like this?' who johnny the sportsman with the hair that turned white in a single night the barker on the skyline does he often get the wind up like this his colleague smiled tolerantly why that's nothing he replied wait till you see him really cut loose that was just a gentle whisper my god said the newcomer staring into a bleak future the leading lady came to the end of her refrain and the gentleman of the ensemble who had been hanging about upstage began to curvet nimbly down towards her in a double line the new arrival with an eye on his nearest neighbour endeavouring to curvet as nimbly as the others a clapping of hands from the dark audition indicated inappropriately that he had failed to do so mr miller could be perceived dimly with all his fingers entwined in his hair clear the stage yelled mr miller not you he shouted as the latest addition to the company began to drift off with the others you stay me yes you i shall have to teach you the steps by yourself or we shall get nowhere go up stage start the music again mr salzburg now when the refrain begins come down gracefully gracefully the young man pink but determined began to come down gracefully and it was while he was thus occupied that jill and nelly bryant entering the wings which were beginning to fill up as eleven o'clock approached saw him whoever is that said nelly new man replied one of the chorus gentlemen came this morning nelly turned to jill he looks just like mr rook she exclaimed he is mr rook said jill he can't be he is but what is he doing here jill bit her lip that's just what i'm going to ask him myself she said two the opportunity for a private conversation with freddie did not occur immediately for ten minutes he remained alone on the stage absorbing abusive tuition from mr miller and at the end of that period a further ten minutes was occupied with the rehearsing of the number with the leading lady and the rest of the male chorus when finally a roar from the back of the auditorium announced the arrival of mr goble and at the same time indicated mr goble's desire that the stage should be cleared and the rehearsal proper begin a wan smile of recognition and a faint what ho was all that freddie was able to bestow upon jill before with the rest of the ensemble they had to go out and group themselves for the opening chorus it was only when this had been run through four times and the stage left vacant for two of the principals to play a scene that jill was able to draw the last of the rooks aside in a dark corner and put him to the question freddy what are you doing here freddy mopped his streaming brow johnson miller's idea of an opening chorus was always strenuous on the present occasion the ensemble were supposed to be guests at a long island house party and mr miller's conception of the gathering suggested that he supposed house-party guests on long island to consist exclusively of victims of st vitus dance freddie was feeling limp battered and exhausted and from what he had gathered the worst was yet to come eh he said feebly what are you doing here oh ah uh, yes i see what you mean i suppose you're surprised to find me in new york what i am not surprised to find you in new york i knew you had come over but i am surprised to find you on stage being bullied by mr miller i say said freddie in an odd voice he is a bit of a nut that lad what he reminds me of the troops of midian in the hymn the chappies who prowled and prowled around i bet he's worn a groove in the carpet like a jolly old tiger at the zoo at feeding time wouldn't be surprised at any moment to look down and find him biting a piece out of my leg jill seized his arm and shook it don't ramble freddie tell me how you got here oh that was pretty simple i had a letter of introduction to this chappie pilkington who's running this show and we having got pretty tolerably pally in the last few days i went to him and asked him to let me join the merry throng i said i didn't want any money and the little bit of work i would do wouldn't make any difference so he said right ho or words to that effect and here i am but why you can't be doing this for fun surely fun a pained expression came into freddie's face my idea of fun isn't anything in which jolly old miller the bird with the snowy hair is permitted to mix something tells me that that lad is going to make it his life work 
picking on me. No, I didn't do this for fun. I had a talk with Wally Mason the night before last, and he seemed to think that being in the chorus wasn't the sort of thing you ought to be doing. So I thought it over and decided that I ought to join the troupe, too. Then I could always be on the spot, don't you know, if there was any trouble. I mean to say I'm not much of a chap and all that sort of thing, but still I might come in handy one of these times. Keep a fatherly eye on you, don't you know, and what not? Jill was touched. You're a dear, Freddy. I thought, don't you know, it would make poor old Derek a bit easier in his mind. Jill froze. I don't want to talk about Derek, Freddy, please. Oh, I know what you must be feeling. Pretty sick, I'll bet what, but if you could see him now— I don't want to talk about him. He's pretty cut up, you know. Regrets bitterly and all that sort of thing. He wants you to come back again. I see. He sent you to fetch me? That was more or less the idea. It's a shame that you had all that trouble. You can get messenger boys to go anywhere and do anything nowadays. Derek ought to have thought of that. Freddy looked at her doubtfully. You're spoofing, aren't you? I mean to say, you wouldn't have liked that. I shouldn't have disliked it any more than his sending you. Oh, but I wanted to pop over, keen to see America, and so forth. Jill looked past him at the gloomy stage. Her face was set, and her eyes somber. Can't you understand, Freddy? You've known me a long time. I should have thought that you would have found out by now that I have a certain amount of pride. If Derek wanted me back, there was only one thing for him to do. Come over and find me himself. Rummy! That's what Mason said when I told him. You two don't realize how dashed busy Derek is these days. Busy. Something in her face seemed to tell Freddy that he was not saying the right thing, but he stumbled on. You've no notion how busy he is. I mean to say, elections coming on and so forth. He daren't stir from the metrop. Of course, I couldn't expect him to do anything that might interfere with his career, could I? Absolutely not. I knew you would see it, said Freddy, charmed at her reasonableness. All rot what you read about women being unreasonable. Then I take it it's all right, eh? All right? I mean, you will toddle home with me at the earliest op and make poor old Derek happy? Jill laughed discordantly. Ha, <laughs> ha! Poor old Derek, she echoed. He has been badly treated, hasn't he? Well, I wouldn't say that, said Freddy doubtfully. You see, coming down to it, the thing was more or less his fault, what? More or less? I mean to say, more or less? Freddy glanced at her anxiously. He was not at all sure that he liked the way she was looking or the tone in which she spoke. He was not a keenly observant young man, but there did begin at this point to seep through his brain centers a suspicion that all was not well. "'Let me pull myself together,' said Freddy warily to his immortal soul. "'I believe I'm getting the raspberry.' And there was silence for a space. The complexity of life began to weigh upon Freddy. Life was like one of those shots at squash which seem so simple till you go to knock the cover off the ball when the ball sort of edges away from you and you miss it. Life, Freddy began to perceive, was apt to have a nasty backspin on it. He had never had any doubt when he had started that the only difficult part of this expedition to America would be the finding of Jill. Once found, he had presumed that she would be delighted to hear his good news and would joyfully accompany him home on the next boat. It appeared now, however, that he had been too sanguine. Optimist as he was, he had to admit that as far as could be ascertained with the naked eye, the jolly old binge might be said to have sprung a leak. He proceeded to approach the matter from another angle. I say! Yes? You do love old Derek, don't you? I mean to say, you know what I mean, love him and all that sort of rot? I don't know. You don't know? Oh, I say, come now, you must know. Pull up your socks, old thing. I mean, pull yourself together. You either love a chappie or you don't. Jill smiled painfully. How nice it would be if everything were as simple and straightforward as that. Haven't you ever heard that the dividing line between love and hate is just a thread? Poets have said so a great number of times. Oh, poets, said Freddy, dismissing the genus with a wave of the hand. He had been compelled to read Shakespeare and all that sort of thing at school, but it had left him cold, and since growing to a man's estate he had rather handed the race of bards the mitten. He liked Doss Chitterdross's stuff in the Sporting Times, but beyond that he was not much of a lad for poets. "'Can't you understand a girl in my position not being able to make up her mind whether she loves a man or despises him?' Freddy shook his head. "'No,' he said. "'It sounds dashed silly to me.' 
then what's the good of talking cried jill it only hurts but won't you come back to england no oh i say be a sport take a stab at it jill laughed again another of those grating laughs which afflicted freddie with a sense of foreboding and failure something had undoubtedly gone wrong with the works he began to fear that at some point in the conversation just where he could not say he had been less diplomatic than he might have been you speak as if you were inviting me to a garden party no i won't take a stab at it you've a lot to learn about women freddy women are rum conceded that perplexed ambassador jill began to move away don't go urged freddy why not what's the use of talking any more have you ever broken an arm or a leg freddy yes said freddy mystified as a matter of fact my last year at oxford playing soccer for the college in a friendly game some blighter barged into me and i came down on my wrist but it hurt like the deuce and then it began to get better i suppose well used you to hit it and twist it and prod it or did you leave it alone to try and heal i won't talk any more about derrick i simply won't i'm all smashed up inside and i don't know if i'm ever going to get well again but at least i'm going to give myself a chance i'm working as hard as ever i can and i'm forcing myself not to think of him i'm in a sling freddie like your wrist and i don't want to be prodded i hope we shall see a lot of each other while you're over here you always were the greatest dear in the world but you mustn't mention derrick again and you mustn't ask me to go home if you avoid those subjects we'll be as happy as possible and now i'm going to leave you to talk to poor nelly she has been hovering round for the last ten minutes waiting for a chance to speak to you she worships you you know freddie started violently oh i say what rot jill had gone and he was still gaping after her when nelly bryant moved towards him shyly like a worshipper approaching a shrine hello mr rook said nelly hello 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 said freddie nelly fixed her large eyes on his face a fleeting impression passed through freddie's mind that she was looking unusually pretty this morning nor was the impression unjustified nelly was wearing for the first time a spring suit which was the outcome of hours of painful selection among the wares of a dozen different stores and the knowledge that the suit was just right seemed to glow from her like an inner light she felt happy and her happiness had lent an unwanted color to her face and a soft brightness to her eyes how nice it is your being here freddie waited for the inevitable question the question with which jill had opened their conversation but it did not come he was surprised but relieved he hated long explanations and he was very doubtful whether loyalty to jill could allow him to give them to nelly his reason for being where he was had to do so intimately with jill's most private affairs a wave of gratitude to nelly swept through him when he realized that she was either incurious or else too delicate-minded to show inquisitiveness as a matter of fact it was delicacy that kept nelly silent seeing freddie here at the theatre she had as is not uncommon with fallible mortals put two and two together and made the answer four when it was not four at all she had been deceived by circumstantial evidence jill whom she had left in england wealthy and secure she had met again in new york penniless as the result of some stock exchange cataclysm in which she remembered with the vagueness with which one recalls once heard pieces of information freddie rook had been involved true she seemed to recollect hearing that freddie's losses had been comparatively slight but his presence in the chorus of the rose of america seemed to her proof that after all they must have been devastating she could think of no other reason except loss of money which could have placed freddie in the position in which he now found him so she accepted it and with the delicacy which was innate in her and which a hard life had never blunted decided directly she saw him to make no allusion to the disaster such was nelly's view of the matter and sympathy gave to her manner a kind of maternal gentleness which acted on freddie raw from his late encounter with mr johnson miller and disturbed by jill's attitude in the matter of poor old derrick like a healing balm his emotions were too chaotic for analysis but one thing stood out clear from the welter the fact that he was glad to be with nelly as he had never been glad to be with a girl before and found her soothing as he had never supposed a girl could be soothing they talked desultorily of unimportant things and every minute found freddie more convinced that nelly was not as other girls he felt that he must see more of her i say he said when this binge is over when the rehearsal finishes you know what about a bite to eat i should love it i generally go to the automat 
the how much never heard of it in times square it's cheap you know i was thinking of the cosmopolis but that's so expensive oh i don't know much the same as any of the other places isn't it nelly's manner became more motherly than ever she bent forward and touched his arm affectionately you haven't to keep up any front with me she said gently i don't care whether you're rich or poor or what i mean of course i'm awfully sorry you've lost your money but it makes it all the easier for us to be real pals don't you think so lost my money well i know you wouldn't be here if you hadn't i wasn't going to say anything about it but when you talked of the cosmopolis i just had to you lost your money in the same thing jill mariner lost hers didn't you i was sure you had the moment i saw you here who cares money isn't everything astonishment kept freddy silent for an instant after that he refrained from explanations of his own free will he accepted the situation and rejoiced in it like many other wealthy and modest young men he had always had a sneaking suspicion at the back of his mind that any girl who was decently civil to him was so from mixed motives or more likely motives that were not even mixed well dash it here was a girl who seemed to like him although under the impression that he was broke to the wide it was an intoxicating experience it made him feel a better chap it fortified his self-respect you know he said stammering a little for he found a sudden difficulty in controlling his voice you're a dashed good sort i'm awfully glad you think so there was a silence as far at least as he and she were concerned in the outer world beyond the piece of scenery under whose shelter they stood stirring things loud and exciting things seemed to be happening some sort of an argument appeared to be in progress the rasping voice of mr goble was making itself heard from the unseen auditorium these things they sensed vaguely but they were too occupied with each other to ascertain details what was the name of that place again asked freddy the what o something the automat that's the little chap we'll go there shall we the food's quite good you go and help yourself out of slot machines you know my favorite indoor sport said freddy with enthusiasm hello what's up it sounds as if there were dirty work at the crossroads the voice of the assistant stage manager was calling sharply excited agitation in every syllable all the gentlemen of the chorus on the stage please mr goble wants all the chorus gentlemen on the stage well cheerio for the present said freddy i suppose i'd better look into this he made his way on to the stage three there is an insidious something about the atmosphere of a rehearsal of a musical play which saps the finer feelings of those connected with it softened by the gentle beauty of the spring weather mr goble had come to the gotham theatre that morning in an excellent temper firmly intending to remain in an excellent temper all day five minutes of the rose of america had sent him back to the normal and at ten minutes past eleven he was chewing his cigar and glowering at the stage with all the sweetness gone from his soul when wally mason arrived at quarter past eleven and dropped into the seat beside him the manager received him with a grunt and even omitted to offer him a cigar when a new york theatrical manager does that it is a certain sign that his mood is of the worst one may find excuses for mr goble the rose of america would have tested the equanimity of a far more amiable man and on mr goble what otis pilkington had called its delicate whimsicality jarred profoundly he had been brought up in the lower-browed school of musical comedy where you shelved the plot after the opening number and filled in the rest of the evening by bringing on the girls in a variety of exotic costumes with some good vaudeville specialists to get the laughs mr goble's idea of a musical piece was something embracing trained seals acrobats and two or three teams of skilled buck and wing dancers with nothing on the stage from a tree to a lampshade which could not suddenly turn into a chorus girl the austere legitimateness of the rose of america gave him a pain in the neck he loathed plot and the rose of america was all plot why then had the earthy mr goble consented to associate himself with the production of this intellectual play because he was subject like all other new york managers to intermittent spasms of the idea that the time is ripe for revival of comic opera sometimes lunching in his favorite corner of the cosmopolis grill-room he would lean across the table and beg some other manager to take it from him that the time was ripe for a revival of comic opera or more cautiously that pretty soon the time was going to be ripe for a revival of comic opera 
and the other manager would nod his head and thoughtfully stroke his three chins and admit that sure as god made little apples the time was darn soon going to be ripe for a revival of comic opera and then they would stuff themselves with rich food and light big cigars and brood meditatively with most managers these spasms which may be compared to twinges of conscience pass as quickly as they come and they go back to coining money with rowdy musical comedies quite contented but otis pilkington happening along with the script of the rose of america and the cash to back it had caught mr goble in the full grip of an attack and all the arrangements had been made before the latter emerged from the influence he now regretted his rash act say listen he said to wally his gaze on the stage his words proceeding from the corner of his mouth you've got to stick around with this show after it opens on the road we'll talk terms later but we've got to get it right don't care what it costs see you think it will need fixing mr goble scowled at the unconscious artists who were now going through a particularly arid stretch of dialogue fixing it's all wrong it don't add up right you'll have to rewrite it from end to end well i've got some idea about it i saw it played by amateurs last summer you know i could make a quick job of it if you want me to but will the author stand for it mr goble allowed a belligerent eye to stray from the stage and twisted it around in wally's direction say listen he'll stand for anything i say i'm the little guy that gives orders around here i'm the big noise as if in support of this statement he suddenly emitted a terrific bellow the effect was magical the refined and painstaking artists on the stage stopped as if they had been shot the assistant stage director bent sedulously over the footlights which had now been turned up shading his eyes with the prompt script take that over again shouted mr goble yes that speech about life being like a watermelon it don't sound to me as though it meant anything he cocked his cigar at an angle and listened fiercely he clapped his hands the action stopped again cut it said mr goble tersely cut the speech mr goble queried the obsequious assistant stage director yes cut it it don't mean nothing down the aisle springing from a seat in the back shimmered mr pilkington wounded to the quick mr goble mr goble well that is the best epigram in the play the best what epigram the best epigram in the play mr goble knocked the ash off his cigar the public don't want epigrams the public don't like epigrams i've been in the show business fifteen years and i'm telling you epigrams give them a pain under the vest all right get on mr pilkington fluttered agitatedly this was his first experience of mr goble in the capacity of stage director it was the latter's custom to leave the early rehearsals of the pieces with which he was connected to a subordinate producer who did what mr goble called the breaking in this accomplished he would appear in person undo most of the other's work make cuts tell the actors how to read their lines and generally enjoy himself producing plays was mr goble's hobby he imagined himself to have a genius in that direction and it was useless to try to induce him to alter any decision to which he might have come he regarded those who did not agree with him with the lofty contempt of an eastern despot of this mr pilkington was not yet aware but mr goble the potentate swung irritably around on him what is it what is it can't you see i'm busy that epigram it's out but it's out surely protested mr pilkington almost tearfully i have a voice sure you have a voice retorted mr goble and you can use it any old place you want except in my theatre have all the voice you like go round the corner and talk to yourself sing in your bath but don't come using it here cause i'm the little guy that does all the talking in this theatre that fellow makes me tired he added complainingly to wally as mr pilkington withdrew like a foiled python he don't know nothing about the show business and he keeps butting in and making fool suggestions he ought to be darn glad he's getting his first play produced and not trying to teach me how to direct it he clapped his hands imperiously the assistant stage manager bent over the footlights what was that that guy said lord finchley's last speech take it again the gentleman who was playing the part of lord finchley an english character actor who specialized in london nuts raised his eyebrows annoyed like mr pilkington he had never before come into contact with mr goble as stage director and accustomed to the suaver methods of his native land he was finding the experience trying 
he had not yet recovered from the agony of having that watermelon line cut out of his part it was the only good line he considered that he had any line that is cut out of an actor's part is always the only good line he has the speech about omar khayyam he inquired with suppressed irritation i thought that was the way you said it all wrong it's omar of khayyam i think you will find that omar khayyam is the uh, generally accepted version of the poet's name said the portrayer of lord finchley adding beneath his breath you silly ass you say omar of khayyam bellowed mr goble who's running this show anyway just as you please mr goble turned to wally these actors he began when mr pilkington appeared again at his elbow mr goble mr goble what is it now omar khayyam was a persian poet his name was khayyam that isn't the way i heard it said mr goble doggedly did you he inquired of wally i thought he was born at khayyam you're probably quite right said wally but if so everybody else has been wrong for a good many years it's usually supposed that the gentleman's name was omar khayyam khayyam omar j born a d ten fifty educated privately at baghdad university represented persia in the olympic games of ten seventy two winning the sitting high jump and the egg and spoon race the khayyams were quite a well-known family in baghdad and there was a lot of talk when omar who was mrs khayyam's pet son took to drink and writing poetry they had had it all fixed up for him to go into his father's date business mr goble was impressed he had a respect for wally's opinion for wally had written follow the girl and look what a knockout that had been he stopped the rehearsal again go back to that khayyam speech he said interrupting lord finchley in mid-sentence the actor whispered a hearty english oath beneath his breath he had been up late last night and in spite of the fair weather he was feeling a trifle on edge in the words of omar of khayyam mr goble clapped his hands cut that off he said the show's too long anyway and having handled a delicate matter in a masterly fashion he leaned back in his chair and chewed the end off another cigar for some minutes after this the rehearsal proceeded smoothly if mr goble did not enjoy the play at least he made no criticisms except to wally to him he enlarged from time to time on the pain which the rose of america caused him how i ever came to put on junk like this beats me confessed mr goble frankly you probably saw that there was a good idea at the back of it suggested wally there is you know properly handled it's an idea that could be made into a success what would you do with it oh a lot of things said wally warily in his younger and callower days he had sometimes been rash enough to scatter views on the reconstruction of plays broadcast to find them gratefully absorbed and acted upon and treated as a friendly gift his affection for mr goble was not so overpowering as to cause him to give him ideas for nothing now any time you want me to fix it for you i'll come along about one and a half per cent of the gross would meet the case i think mr goble faced him registering the utmost astonishment and horror one and a half per cent for fixing a show like this why darn it there's hardly anything to do to it it's it's in you called it junk just now well all i meant was it wasn't the sort of thing i cared for myself the public will eat it take it from me the time is just about ripe for a revival of comic opera this one will want all the reviving you can give it better use a pulmotor but that long boob that pilkington he would never stand for my handing you one and a half per cent i thought you were the little guy who arranged things around here but he's got money in the show well if he wants to get any out he'd better call in somebody to rewrite it you don't have to engage me if you don't want to but i know i could make a good job of it there's just one little twist the thing needs and you could have quite a different piece what's that inquired mr goble casually oh just a little what shall i say a little touch of what do you call it and a bit of thingamy you know the sort of thing that's all it wants mr goble gnawed his cigar baffled you think so eh he said at length and perhaps a suspicion of je ne sais quoi added wally mr goble worried his cigar and essayed a new form of attack you've done a lot of work for me he said good work glad you liked it said wally i like having you around i was half thinking of giving you a show to do this fall corking book french farce ran two years in paris but what's the good if you want the earth 
always useful the earth good thing to have see here if you'll fix up this show for half of one per cent i'll give you the other to do you shouldn't slur your words so for a moment i thought you said half of one per cent one and a half of course you really said if you won't take half you don't get the other all right said wally there are lots of other managers in new york haven't you seen them popping about rich enterprising men and all of them love me like a son make it one per cent said mr goble and i'll see if i can fix it with pilkington one and a half oh damn it one and a half then said mr goble morosely what's the good of splitting straws forgotten sports of the past splitting the straw all right if you drop me a line to that effect legibly signed with your name i'll wear it next to my heart i shall have to go now i have a date good-bye glad everything's settled and everybody's happy for some moments after wally had left mr goble sat hunched up in his orchestra chair smoking sullenly his mood less sunny than ever living in a little world of sycophants he was galled by the off-hand way in which wally always treated him there was something in the latter's manner which seemed to him sometimes almost contemptuous he regretted the necessity of having to employ him there was of course no real necessity why he should have employed wally new york was full of librettists who would have done the work equally well for half the money but like most managers mr goble had the mental processes of a sheep follow the girl was the last outstanding musical success in new york theatrical history wally had written it therefore nobody but wally was capable of rewriting the rose of america the thing had for mr goble the inevitability of fate except for deciding mentally that wally had swelled head there was nothing to be done having decided that wally had swelled head and not feeling much better mr goble concentrated his attention on the stage a good deal of action had taken place there during the recently concluded business talk and the unfortunate lord finchley was back again playing another of his scenes mr goble glared at lord finchley he did not like him and he did not like the way he was speaking his lines the part of lord finchley was a non-singing role it was a tight part otis pilkington had gone to the straight stage to find an artist and had secured the not uncelebrated wentworth hill who had come over from london to play an english comedy which had just closed the newspapers had called the play thin but had thought that wentworth hill was an excellent comedian mr hill thought so too and it was consequently a shock to his already disordered nerves when a bellow from the auditorium stopped him in the middle of one of his speeches and a rasping voice informed him that he was doing it all wrong i beg your pardon said mr hill quietly but dangerously stepping to the footlights all wrong repeated mr goble really wentworth hill who a few years earlier had spent several terms at oxford university before being sent down for aggravated disorderliness had brought little away with him from that seat of learning except the oxford manner this he now employed upon mr goble with an icy severity which put the last touch to the manager's fermenting state of mind perhaps you would be kind enough to tell me just how you think that part should be played mr goble marched down the aisle speak out to the audience he said stationing himself by the orchestra pit you're turning your head away all the darn time i may be wrong said mr hill but i have played a certain amount don't you know in pretty good companies and i was always under the impression that one should address one's remarks to the person one was speaking to not deliver a recitation to the gallery i was taught that that was the legitimate method the word touched off all the dynamite in mr goble of all things in the theatre he detested most the legitimate method his idea of producing was to instruct the cast to come down to the footlights and hand it to em these people who looked up stage and talked to the audience through the backs of their necks revolted him legitimate that's a hell of a thing to be where do you get that legitimate stuff you aren't playing ibsen nor am i playing a knockabout vaudeville sketch don't talk back at me kindly don't shout at me your voice is unpleasant enough without your raising it open defiance was a thing which mr goble had never encountered before and for a moment it deprived him of breath he recovered it however almost immediately you're fired on the contrary said mr hill i'm resigning he drew a green-covered script from his pocket and handed it with an air to the pallid assistant stage-manager 
then more gracefully than ever freddie rook had managed to move down stage under the tuition of johnson miller he moved up stage to the exit i trust that you will be able to find someone who will play the part according to your ideas i'll find bellowed mr goble at his vanishing back a chorus man who'll play it a damn sight better than you he waved to the assistant stage director send the chorus man on the stage all the gentlemen of the chorus on the stage please shrilled the assistant stage director bounding into the wings like a retriever mr goble wants all the chorus gentlemen on the stage there was a moment when the seven male members of the rose of america ensemble lined up self-consciously before his gleaming eyes when mr goble repented of his brave words an uncomfortable feeling passed across his mind that fate had called his bluff and that he would not be able to make good all chorus men are exactly alike and they are like nothing else on earth even mr goble anxious as he was to overlook their deficiencies could not persuade himself that in their ranks stood even an adequate lord finchley and then just as a cold reaction from his fervid mood was about to set in he perceived that providence had been good to him there at the extreme end of the line stood a young man who as far as appearance went was the ideal lord finchley as far as appearance went a far better lord finchley than the late mr hill he beckoned imperiously you at the end me said the young man yes you what's your name rook freddie rook don't you know you're english aren't you eh oh yes absolutely ever played a part before part oh i oh, i see what you mean well in amateur theatricals you know and all that sort of rot his words were music to mr goble's ears he felt that his napoleonic action had justified itself by success his fury left him if he had been capable of beaming one would have said that he beamed at freddy well you play the part of lord finchley from now on come to my office this afternoon for your contract clear the stage we've wasted enough time five minutes later in the wings freddy receiving congratulations from nelly bryant asserted himself not the automat to-day i think what now that i'm a jolly old star and all that sort of thing it can't be done directly this is over we'll roll round to the cosmopolis a slight celebration is indicated what right ho rally round dear heart rally round end of chapter fourteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com